So my apologies, uh, as you can tell, it's already 9 a.m., but we're going to give it a few more minutes because uh, I hear that the entry security check has a bit of a long line, and we're still missing one of our five speakers, and I can see that uh, the audience is still a bit sparse, so I assume a lot of people are caught in line trying to, to enter. We'll, we'll delay at least till our fi final speaker arrives and so that we have the full panel of five speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning. Welcome to this panel discussion on accountability for human rights, mitigate unfair bias in AI. My name is Bernard Shen. I'm an assistant general counsel at Microsoft. I worked on human rights issues in our cloud services and technologies, including human rights dimensions in artificial intelligence. I'm the organizer for this session and will serve as a moderator to facilitate, facilitate the panel discussion. Core to Microsoft's DNA is to provide technological tools to every person and every organization around the world so that everyone is empowered to achieve more. Yes, we use AI technology ourselves in our own services, but increasingly, we are also providing AI to customers so that they can infuse their and transform their own operations with AI. Through that experience, we learned that leveraging the best of human intelligence and artificial intelligence can bring enormous benefits to society. But whether we're using artificial intelligence or human intelligence, there's always the risk of unfair bias, even though the bias may be unintended. We also understand that while working very hard on these issues internally in the company is essential, it is not enough. AI is being used in so many fields of human endeavors, both the benefits and the issues in each field is unique and contextual. There is a lot to learn and a lot to figure out. And we commit ourselves to reach out, engage with customers, governments, civil society, academia, and other companies to learn together and make progress together. This session is, a, is an example of that. We have a panel of speakers to discuss and look at these issues from a broad range of perspectives and ex expertise. Let me introduce them. To my left, Wafa Ben Hassin is the head of policy in the Middle East North Africa region for Access Now, a global nonprofit that works to protect human rights in the digital age. To her left is Scott Campbell, senior human rights officer at the United Nations Human Rights Office, where he leads their work on technology and human rights in the Silicon Valley area. Further to his left is Sana Karigani, deputy director, head of office for AI, a joint unit between the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, in Her Majesty's government. And to her left is David, uh, David Reichel, a social scientist, researcher, and data analyst at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA. David is responsible for managing FRA's work on artificial intelligence, big data, and fundamental rights. And you'll notice a missing chair. Unfortunately, my colleague from Microsoft Research Montreal has not been able to arrive. I heard that even a few minutes ago, the line entering through security is half a block long. Uh, hopefully that she's just caught up in that and that not some other uh, emergency. So let me briefly introduce her and when she, hopefully she would be able to join us soon. Uh, my colleague at Microsoft Research Montreal, she's a data scientist, research manager at Microsoft Research Montreal. Her research focus on language-based AI technologies such as conversational agents. I also want to introduce to my right my colleague Camille Fasiaga. She's a government affairs manager at Microsoft France. So because we have online participation, she's going to manage and facilitate the participant of online attendees in the session. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. In order to get to an interactive conversation as quickly as possible, we talked in advance and decided that we're going to forego some formalities. We're not going to have formal opening statements by each panelist. We're just going to launch right into the discussion. And as you know, we're starting a little late because of some technical difficulty trying to make sure the online participation works. So we're about 10, 15 minute uh, late start. My understanding is that 10 minutes after the end of schedule, end of the session, there's another session. So I'm going to take the liberty to go a little bit over time. If you need to leave, I understand so that to make up for some of that lost time. The session is going to have two parts. 
uh, and there will be an opportunity for audience to participate at the end of each part, both in the room and online participants. When, when we get to that, we're going to alternate. Hopefully, if there'll be questions both in room and online, and we'll alternate between in room and online participants. So part one has three subparts. Uh, part one first, we're going to have a brief explanation of what we mean by AI. Uh, Layla was going to cover that. We'll see how we manage. Maybe I can substitute for her. It's to provide a common understanding context for the discussion of specific issues to follow. Second, we're, gonna, we're going to discuss the benefits and opportunities of AI to advance human rights and sustainable development goals. Third, we're going to explore human rights questions and concerns on the responsible use of AI. Then part two has two subparts. The first part is to discuss uh, government laws, regulations, policies, and actions that would promote innovation and responsible and effective use of AI, particularly to address concerns of unfa unfair bias and the, and the opportunities to advance human rights and the SDGs, for example, gender equality and reduce inequalities. Second, we're going to, and last, we're going to explore ways and opportunities for different stakeholders to collaborate, share learnings, good practices, and find out how we can work together, even beyond IGF, uh, to make progress together. So with that, we're going to launch into part one. And uh, Layla, if she were here, she was going to give a brief explanation for AI. And, and I don't know the, uh, the kind of the background of audience members, so I'll keep it very brief, because I'm not a data scientist. I, I'm going to just try to uh, live up to what Layla would have been able to do in a couple of minutes. Basically. AI can mean many things, and it's been around a long time, but in today's context, we generally think of that as using a lot of data, feeding that through mathematical models to achieve machine learning. The machine is basically the mathematical models. There are so many different types of math and st statistical models that based on the purpose you're trying to achieve, you feed a lot of relevant data through that to create a prediction model that can give you, to help you provide you with recommendations, predictions, so that as you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do, you have new data coming in, you feed that in your, through your prediction model, the model is going to spit out a suggestion, a prediction, and uh, you can take that into account and make your final decision as humans. So uh, that's the best I can, can do as a non-data scientist. I'm sure if Leila were here, she would be able to do much better than I do. So let's go into some of the policy dimensions and implications of all of this. Um, the first question I'm going to start with is, the more constructive, positive aspect of this. What are the benefits and opportunities that we can, uh, for good, that we can use AI for? So with that, just to kick off the conversation, I am going to turn it over to Sana. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, so there are quite a few benefits to AI, not least of which introducing productivity in the, in the things that we do. Um, there are two big areas um, that we are looking at from the UK government. One major one is productivity in the public sector. So how do we use automation and machine learning and other algorithms to make ourselves more productive? The second is to look broadly across the sectors and think about how do we use artificial intelligence technologies to make public services better for society. And finally, we're looking at some of the technologies and how they are being used within the sectors uh, and the effects that they have. And this is where you have, uh, when you start talking about decision-making algorithms and targeting and other kind of um, capabilities that these technologies have is where you start to run into some of the questions that we'll be getting into later, which is the, the double-edged kind of benefits of AI, where on one side it's, it's uh, a wonderful thing to have, on the other side it's really important to think about all the consequences that, that might fall out of something that's quite beneficial. So for example, on targeting and profiling, um, that's done online, that's it's quite lovely in a way that it uh, makes your online experience much better, it allows you to see ads that are relevant to you, it allows you to see content that you're interested in, um, it makes sure that you don't waste your time uh, looking at a bunch of stuff that isn't relevant. 
Um, similarly, automated decision making, which helps uh, in, in a lot of ways remove bias that we inherently as humans have and introduce into, into systems. Um, um, and we've seen lots and lots of effects of this where certain people before lunch, after lunch may make different types of decisions. Using decision making by an algorithm takes out some of the biases that we have ourselves and allows us to be more productive. But again, these are, these are examples of, of areas where we need to be very careful in terms of exactly what the parameters are and, and, and how we make sure that the, the benefits are actually what we gain equally across society rather than seeing uh, unfair bias or other things uh, play a role in this. Thank you, Asana. Uh, Scott, I know that the UN High Commissioner uh, Office is very focused on, on missions to advance human rights. So what is some of the work or future opportunities that you know the office may be thinking about you, AI could be used and applied to help with that mission? Thanks, Werner. Um, I mean, there are seemingly endless opportunities uh, to use artificial intelligence uh, and really on a wide range of, of fronts that encompass the full spectrum of, of human rights. So it's, it's a very long list of, of opportunities actually that we struggle with in terms of prioritizing and determining where we should focus our, our energies. Um, there, in parallel with that, there are seemingly, seemingly endless opportunities uh, how artificial intelligence can be used to reach the SDGs. Just I mean, for one, one quick example, um, looking at civil and political rights uh, and artificial intelligence, which is an, an area perhaps less looked at in terms of how human rights can be uh, enhanced through the use of art artificial intelligence. But if we look at freedom of expression and building a little bit on what, what Sana was, was saying, um, access to information, the possibility to both reach uh, specific kinds of information and to reach specific kinds of, of people or constituencies or industries or, or stakeholders that you may want to reach as a human rights advocate. Um, using artificial intelligence, uh, you can uh, greatly uh, increase your, uh, your impact in promoting a, a particular um, cause or, or human rights issue. Um, similarly to that, um, access to, you know, to information empowers people very, very broadly and linking that with, with the SDGs, um, there are many examples of how uh, artificial intelligence can be used uh, to enhance the SDGs. Again, a very, a very long list. Perhaps for this panel, we'll focus um, primarily on um, SDG 5, uh, uh, gender, gender equality, uh, and SDG 10, uh, reduce inequalities. And AI is, is being used, um, as also as Sana said, it's both a, a double-edged sword here but AI can be used to reduce inequalities, um, to detect discrimination uh, on a number of grounds, including gender, but also race uh, and, and a wide range of, uh, of factors. Um, maybe finally, just to note how AI, uh, linking it with, with the SDGs, uh, can just be leveraged to provide um, such a, a broad range of social and economic opportunities um, to realize a broad range of human rights that are intertwined with virtually all of the, uh, all the SDGs better health outcomes, more online economic opportunities to reach social and economic rights. But I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Scott. Um, and and as, as, I, as we progress, you know, feel free, you know, any panelists to, to interject with any comments. And, uh, you know, short of that, I'm, I'm going to move through all of you to, uh, to kind of uh, as move the conversation along. So next I want to talk to you, Wafa. I know that civil society, human rights organizations uh, have a lot of, rightfully have a lot of questions, concerns with the use of AI, but in terms of opportunities to use it for, for positive purposes, purposes to help and advance human rights, what's the civil society perspective or particularly your perspective or Access Now perspective on how we could use it? You know, we're, we're going to get to the, the risk and, and, and problems you know, soon enough in this conversation, but what is your perspective on how we can use it to actually propel, advance, and help human rights? Uh, thank you so much, Bernard. Uh, I, I guess I would echo what Scott just said about um, how AI or machine learning uh, facilitates primarily, at least from my perspective, uh, the freedom of expression and the right to access information. 
And so these kinds of processes will help uh, citizens all around the world be more active in their societies and, and get the documents that they need to have or get the information that they need to have in order to be active uh, participants and, and citizens and residents of the, of the places they live in. And um, again, the, the potential to use these kinds of machine learning processes is, is endless. I mean, <coughs> you could use it for, for uh, an endless horizon of, of types of, uh, of, uh, of issues. So, uh, but I think whatever it will be used for, and we'll get into this later, uh, still need to respect very basic principles of not just human rights, but also um, holding uh, private actors accountable and uh, having, holding states to a higher standard as well. So. Thank you, Wafa. Uh, David, uh, with the FRA, you work, look at these issues, uh, fundamental rights issues, extensively. From your perspective, what, what are some of the positive, constructive views we can apply uh, AI science to, to, to help advance uh, human rights? Okay, thank you. Um, for, for those who don't know, know the agencies, so, so we are one of the 40, over 40 specialized EU agencies that are tasked with carrying out specific tasks. And, and our mandate is to collect uh, comparable data and provide expertise on fundamental rights related issues to the EU institutions and member states. So obviously our focus is uh, the EU. Um, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights is more or less the, the basic document that we work on. So it has the same legal value as the, the Treaty of the European Union, the Treaty of the Function of the European Union, and that's our starting point. Um, as, as, as many others, of course, we realize the importance of recent technological developments uh, in the area of AI and big data, and whatever uh, terms are being used uh, to describe these new technological developments. And since, as it was mentioned before, the impact on, on all areas of life in one way or the other, we also see that uh, fundamental rights, more or less all fundamental rights, and we can also read fundamental rights as human rights, those who don't know that fundamental rights go a bit beyond human rights, but they mirror all the core uh, human rights as well. And, and all of them are impacted one way or the other, in positive and in negative ways. So it's not only the technology is broadly applied, but also it impacts on a broad way uh, fundamental human rights framework. Um, what we do in our work, we started uh, looking into the positive and negative aspects uh, of, of uh, impacts of new technologies. We try, of course, to, to gather some evidence in Europe. Um, a lot of discussions are in the US at the moment, and we try to see what's actually going on in Europe. I mean, so far, generally looking, we see that among large companies in Europe, it's in two years ago, it was 25% of large companies in Europe said they do some sort of big data analysis. And you can view this from two sides. You can see this is quite a lot, every fourth large company, but you can also say it's only every fourth company. Um, um, when you look at all companies, it's 10% uh, in Europe. Um, so it's interesting to see it, how these new technologies are actually uh, picked up. And then um, when people, use new, new technologies, are they aware of potential human rights implications? And that's what we are going to do uh, in our projects, um, which is currently kicking off. Um, we also, when speaking about the positives, um, I just uh, agree with what was said previously. Um, new technologies can be used to detect uh, human rights violations. I mean, you, we have all these new data and new technologies, which makes it much easier to detect structural problems and, and uh, issues. And this way, we, of course, should embrace it as a positive development, um, apart from general positive developments of technological uh, innovation. Um, and, and that's, I think, we will discuss more on, on, on discrimination. I think discrimination is one of the, the rights that, that uh, is picked up uh, most often, although, as I said, other rights are impacted on as well. But detecting unfair treatment and discrimination and then discussing ways how to mitigate it and reduce it is one of the advantages of technological developments as well. Thank you, David. So you, you and others talk about detecting discrimination. Uh, I wonder if we can unpack that a little bit. Uh, AI technology is starting to go, uh, go into many, many fields, uh, you know, not just the tech companies. A lot of traditional interest industries are trying to explore using that. So a couple of examples that, that I'm thinking about is uh, if, if employers are starting to use it to help make hiring decisions, so uh, uh, 
and in the you know in the past usually that's completely a, a human decision making. Uh, it, honestly, it's kind of hard to know whether human decision making and hiring decisions is it really fair or unbiased or not, uh, or if you're trying to apply a, for a loan from the banks, you know how do they make the decisions? You know if if no AI is involved, people are making decisions. How do they make those decisions? So. I invite any of you to kind of comment, you know, how specifically how would we approach these historically human decision making mechanisms and and find ways to to see if AI technology can help? How you know specifically what does that does that, what does that mean? How would we go about doing that in these different uh, fields that traditionally decisions are made by people? A anyone? Should I have a go and? And we can we can start from there. Um, so uh, it's it's interesting because I think um, I think it's important first to distinguish and not anthropomorphize the, the machine or the the, the decision making algorithm um, as a human. Um, it is uh, it is an algorithm running on data sets, um, and we need to remember that it is us who is feeding the data sets, and it is the algorithm learning off those data sets. So, for example, and and you know for all sorts of good reason they can still um, come up with biased solutions and it is uh, the, the importances of us finding, um, finding what those are and, and why they happen. So um, very recently, uh, Amazon found that its hiring algorithm was very biased. So this is very, very recent within the last, last few weeks. Um, they had trained the algorithm on uh, data sets from their own people within Amazon over the last 10 years, so the, the most successful. Um, and that just happened to be men. And so um, the algorithm then was uh, unfairly being biased against women succeeding in the same area. The algorithm itself um, is not biased or, or sexist or misogynist. It is literally making decisions based on um, a data set that was fed into it by the company. Um, and the company then realized what the problem was and have, have fixed it. Um, but I think it's also really important to, to realize that we ourselves as humans are also, uh, can be very biased in our decision making and in what we see as, as the, the right choices. So in, in identifying, in, un, in understanding and identifying the shortcomings of algorithms, I think it's, it, it gives us that ability to move beyond our own biases and allow uh, a supplementary decision to our own. So I don't think at the moment we're in a place where the algorithm can make a decision uh, without any input, but I think as a supplementary point, decision point to our own, it gives us the ability to move beyond our own biases um, with, with some help. Thank you, Sana. I, I have I have a follow-up question on that. that I love that Amazon example because I read about that recently. And, and not to, uh, I'm no intent to pick on a fellow American company, but that's a fascinating example. I, I remember reading that they discover the issues that they're using training data that's existing employee base, which is probably predominantly male, uh, and therefore it's the resulting model is is biased against women candidates. And what I read was that they were so concerned and. I don't think they were able to fix it. They would actually stop or suspend using it. But it occurred to me that if that's the case, that means that if if a company, that's just not, you know, I don't want to focus on Amazon. If a company's existing employees and the data is such that it's predominantly male, that suggests that up till now, the hiring decisions might not have, you know, there might be some issues in that, that it lack female employees. So, so you know, they try. You know, they in, you know, to their credit, they probably tried to make it more objective to create this model, and they realize it's not working, and then they stop using it. But the problem remains because, as of that point in time, most of the employees are male. So, how would you solve the problem then? And, and you know, this, the pre-existing human decision making is 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 probably biased. Well, agreed. I mean, I'm, I'm going to let the rest of the panelists talk as well. But I think. Um, in, in that specific case, I think there's a more fundamental issue um, in, in getting more female uh, students in STEM courses and, and through the educational system. Um, so I think just there, there is a fundamental uh, question
question there and, a, and something for us to work on together uh, across the world to, to ensure more women are, especially on the Western side of the world, I think, that more women are, are taking these classes and therefore the, the pool to choose from is more equal. Because I think there is a little bit of, uh, uh, it, is, it is a symptom of, of the situation rather than an inherent, I am, you know, going to only hire males to do this job. I, my, my thoughts. Thank you. Watha, you want to, uh, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, so just to also follow up on what Sana was saying and to answer your question as well, I think uh, the, the use of an AI system to do a task that was previ previously done by a human being um, does not necessarily remove the standard requirements that we had um, in terms of responsibility and accountability in um, that human decision-making process. So th I think the question remains is if we're using machine learning as an assistant to make decisions or whether we're using the machine learning process to actually make the decision itself. Um, <coughs> so I think there should always be a human in the loop, especially for high-risk areas like uh, <coughs> criminal justice, um, uh, getting access to health care, uh, border control, et cetera. And, uh, for that, for those sectors, I think human oversight is is especially important and necessary. Can I can I jump in, Bernard? I just want to. I, I think that's a really important point um, that Sana makes. That we essentially we shouldn't we shouldn't expect um, the machines to be better than the humans behind them in terms of their um, uh, uh, ability to to produce um, uh, outcomes that are not not discriminatory. On the other hand, I think we can, we can use the machines um, to try to correct, to detect uh, and identify bias and to, uh, in some ways, uh, fix it or point the humans towards how to fix it, um, what's commonly known as an, an AI audit. But in fact, you can use, use the machines to try to fix their own, their own biases to a certain degree. And then I think the other point that's, that's crucial is those humans, of course, it, it will all depend on how gender biased or other, um, or what other types of biases that the humans have in terms of trying to, to fix a problem, re even recognize the problem, much less fix it. And it points to the importance, also as mentioned, of diversity in the workplace. Uh, and certainly gender diversity has been pointed out as a very serious problem and, and the STEM point is, a, is an excellent one uh, in promoting girls and, and uh, young women's access um, uh, to STEM, but also having even a, a more diverse um, uh, in terms of age, race, national origin, gender, having a very diverse uh, presence in the rooms where both data sets and algorithms are, are being discussed. And I think that combined with AI audits can do quite a bit to, uh, to reduce bias. Yeah, well, can I Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I like the point very much to say that, I mean, machines are not better than humans. Um, and this way, I mean, the point of, of gender discrimination recruitment, for example, is a good uh, point to, to show that uh, the new technologies can actually show that something went wrong uh, previously and can be detected and this way also try to be repaired uh, in the future. Um, and I mean, so um, machine learning or, or AI can perpetuate and reinforce uh, um, biases. It can also create them anew. And there, I think there are different sources of how this can happen. And what was discussed before is, is, is one of the reasons um, that, I mean, we mirror human behavior and then use the data that mirrors human behavior, which might be discriminatory, and then using this to formalize decisions, then we formalize uh, this behavior. And this way, I mean, decisions based on machines are different because it's a formalization of a procedure. And this way can also help to, um, to mitigate these biases. Um, I just want to, to point out to uh, a, f a few, few sources of error. Um, when, for example, looking into European companies using big data, um, almost half of them say they use uh, social media data or geolocation data um, for the big data analysis. Um, and if you look into what, what information people are processing, and there's quite a high likelihood to have one or, few or several uh, information on protected attributes included in the data. Um, and this way, I, I just like to, to read out, for example, Article 21 of the Charter for uh, Fundamental Rights. Uh, it forbids discrimination based on grounds of sex, race, color, ethnic and social origin, genetic features, language, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, membership of national minority, property, birth, disability, age and sexual orientation. 
So that's uh, an important long list. And if you think about the new and diverse data sources that are being used, it's quite highly likely that one or the other in, uh, type of information is related to one of these attributes. And this is very important to discuss uh, when uh, machine learning or AI is used. Um, if I'm allowed to uh, make one more point. Um, so there are, I think there are different ways how discrimination can happen. One is that we have already data that, that have uh, discriminatory behavior mirrored or measured in there. Another one is also the general data quality. And uh, one problem is uh, that people often might use unrepresentative data. So there were several examples where, for example, voice recognition, um, or, or gender detection from images was mainly traced on, on white males. And this way it was shown that it doesn't work as well or, or much worse actually for, for, uh, for women or for especially for black women. And this is quite an, a, a plain problem actually. You use data that are not representative for the target group to which you wanna use uh, your algorithm. And this way um, it can lead to discrimination. Another um, important discussion I think is also when you actually have good quality data, but there's still a difference according to some protected attributes. I'm just looking for example into insurance where you will usually find a difference when you look at car accidents, you will find usually that men have many more accidents than women. So here gender is a, is a proxy for risky driving behavior. And if you don't have any information on risky driving behavior, you will have a difference by gender. And then is the discussion if we have this difference in our data and if the data are of good quality, uh, then we need a, a value-based discussion to what extent it is allowed to treat the groups differently. But what we also know from the literature is that if you have the difference in the data, it's mathematically not possible to treat the groups the same way. And here is an important discussion and trade-off to be made. Yeah, that's, that last part is interesting. I, I think you point to the fact that, that there is, there's, there's bias and there's bias. There's uh, accurate or good bias, and there's, well, that's not unfair or fair, and there's unfair bias. So if, if indeed men get into more car accidents, and the prediction model of a, a male driver applying for insurance probably does warrant a different risk assessment than a female driver applying for insurance. Is that, is that kind of the, the, the gist of, of your comment? That, that in that case, that's not unfair because statistically it is accurate? I think the point is that for, for every situation, again, it needs to be specifically assessed if this uh, amounts to disc uh, illegal discrimination or not. And for the gender example, it was ruled in the EU that there can't be and there can't be any differences on insurance premiums by gender. Um, so it's a very important discussion of our values uh, compared to what we find in the data and where we draw the lines. And it is, however, still a very open and generic discussion because um, in, in Europe we have quite a good uh, policy framework. Um, but at the moment there's also an absence of, of case law. So, so we, we don't have many of these cases, uh, uh, some, lit some litigation on these cases. So I think this will be uh, something for the future to see how this will be decided on by the courts to see actually where the law fits in. Anyone else have uh, an intervention on, on this first part? Hearing none. This is a perfect, because I was about to transition, so let us welcome Leila El Ezri. No problem. So I'm going to transition to the next part, and what's evident to me is that as, even as we talk about benefits, a lot of the comments from you really touch on the risks as well, and it occurs to me really the benefits and the risks are almost uh, two sides of a coin. There are lots of things we could use AI for that could, if used correctly, could bring great benefits, but I think the, the key word there is correctly. <laughs> And there are lots of ways where if, if you don't use correctly, then it, the good intention can turn into a lot of uh, impact. So that's kind of a good transition to the second part of this part one, which is the concerns about unfair treatment. You know, and David, you mentioned many of the basis of and concerns for untre unfair treatment in the, in the charter. So in this next part, I suggest we take a deeper dive in, in talking about that. You know, how do we, Concretely, how do we look for that? Um, what are actual techniques, policies, and steps we can do to look for those types of uh, unfairness or incorrect application? Um, and 
then there's a lot of discussion in this field about transparency and accountability. What does it mean for the technology provider and the people who use the organizations to use this technology to be transparent? What do we have to be transparent about? What do we have to explain? And then beyond explanation, how, what does it mean to be accountable? How, how can organizations or their technology supplier be accountable uh, for these risk and potential problems? So does anyone want to start? Uh, please, welcome. So uh, I think this is a great transition point. Um, private actors, and we can talk about either sta state actors or non-state actors slash private actors, but I think private actors in particular, which are usually the tech companies that use this AI, um, also have a responsibility to protect human rights and that this responsibility exists independent of state obligations. And so as part of fulfilling this responsibility, they um, need to take ongoing proactive and reactive steps in terms of um, ensuring that they do not cause or contribute to human rights abuses and they could do uh, human rights impact assessments as per the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, and so they also need to make sure that when they develop and they deploy these kinds of machine learning systems that they follow um, a, a human rights diligence, due diligence framework. So what does that really mean? Um, it means that, as you mentioned, Bernard, it, they include uh, explainability and uh, intelligibility in the use of these systems so that, uh, for example, the impact on the affected individuals and groups can be effectively scrutinized by independent entities and um, the individuals that are impacted themselves. Um, it also lays out that the responsibilities of who's doing what in implementing the machine learning system uh, are well established. And um, it's also important that actors are held to account. And so, um, and there, so in that framework, there are three core steps really that, um, that make up or compose the due diligence framework here, the human rights due diligence framework. So one is they need to identify potential discriminatory outcomes of the process. Two, uh, private actors or, or um, non-state actors using these types of technologies should also take effective action to prevent uh, and mitigate the discrimination and to track the responses, especially when it comes to feedback data and how that plays into the outcome of the, of the various uh, uh, equations that are used in the machine learning system. Um, and finally, this includes being transparent about um, the first two efforts to identify and prevent and mitigate against discrimination in machine learning systems. So um, there are definitely a lot of solutions. And, um, and I think it's, it's on all of us to kind of take this framework back to where we work and, and, and how we use these technologies to make sure that they're not negatively impacting um, any one particular group over another. And you mentioned, I think, at the beginning of your comments, you know, government uh, user of these technology versus commercial enterprises. Is there, do your comments apply equally to both, or is there any distinction between those two groups of uh, organizations? There is a distinction because states are usually held to higher standards for the public sector regarding the use of artificial intelligence. Um, because states do bear the responsibility and the primary duty to promote and protect, uh, respect and fulfill human rights and so um, under international law. And so um, they, they not only can they not engage or support practices that violate rights, uh, whether it's in designing or implementing the artificial intelligence system, but they're also required to protect people against human rights abuses um, carried out by other actors, um, as well as to take positive actions to facilitate the enjoyment of their rights when uh, being subjected to uh, your data being put into a, a machine learning system. Asana, you want to? Yeah, so I, I have two things um, on this. I think to, to your point, Wafa, I totally agree. I think there is, um, um, there is, the onus is actually on both sets of parties. Um, I would add though that I think the state has a duty to make sure that they create parameters by which innovation can happen well um, and, and allow those parameters to be used by non-state actors to, to kind of play within and develop within um, and, and allow that innovation to happen. Um, there are a number of measures um, the UK government has taken uh, along this. We've uh, introduced the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which looks at 
reviewing and understanding um, AI algorithms and data technologies um, and, and, and what inherent biases may exist in these and, and what, are the, what is that double-edged side of the sword. And the CDEI itself is not a regulator, but it also does influence policy and regulation um, in terms of how do we create a safe playground um, so that innovation, so you don't stifle innovation, um, but you do have the right principles and, and um, parameters by which innovation can happen. Um, so I think there is, there is an absolute responsibility on, on the state to have some parameters around that. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to talk about, just touch on quickly, was around the transparency and accountability point. I think you know, there are a lot of benefits, and we've talked about a few of these, and I think benefits of AI technologies, machine learning algorithms, really come to life when you think about the exact use cases. So whether you're talking about in healthcare, whether you're talking about you know, targeted agriculture, you're talking about um, saving the rainforest through listening algorithms that are alerting you know, the, um, rangers to come if there's chainsaws being used, for example. So it, it ranges so widely across the, the different scenarios and different sectors. But to benefit from these, product, uh, the, these technologies, the, the actual productivity that they introduce in society, the, the technology itself needs to be diffused widely. So not just within the sectors and the, the, the companies themselves, but by, by people. So people need to be able to use them, they need to, to use them, they, they need, it, it becomes a part of the everyday. And for that to happen, you absolutely need trust. So if people don't trust the technology, they don't trust the way their data is being used, um, they, they won't use it. They won't use the technology. And to build that trust, uh, people need to understand how the, how the algorithm is working. And I think that is where we start to get into this need for uh, transparency and accountability and understandability and all of the questions uh, or, or all of the statements that you hear kind of arranging around this stuff. It's, it all, for me, stems to trust, right? If I want to use something, I need to understand it. And if I don't understand it, then I won't buy it. And if I am a minister or a head of state and I don't understand the, the way a decision-making algorithm is, is working, then I don't want to ultimately be accountable for it. So I think there is a, these are all very interrelated. And, um, and I think we need to be really clear about the trade-offs of what we mean when we say these things, right? We, we want to introduce productivity, we, we want our companies to do better, um, but yet we want to understand exactly how an algorithm is working. I think we need to be very clear about exactly what we mean and what we want and, and how in the system of decision making this all falls, comes together. Um, so, so in terms of kind of accountability, transparency, explainability, understandability, all of those itty words, um, I think it's really important for us to understand w what underpins all that, which is trust, and how do we gain public trust, how do we gain public confidence, how do we ensure that we are not trying to drive adoption just for the sake of productivity, forsaking public confidence and trust, because we will then undo all the benefits that we're trying to, to create. Uh, thank you, Sana. So, that's a, I, th I think that's a really insightful observation, and I, I'd love to pursue that further. How do we, how do we gain that trust, and what do we need to explain so that, because there's so many people in the world, and we can't expect every one of them to be data, data scientists, so we have to be able to explain to them in a way that is digestible, so that they can understand how it's being used, how it's affecting them, and is it fair. So what do we need to do to, what do we need to explain and how do we need to explain? I know it's kind of hard to explain that out of context, and even if we can't need to use an example. Anyone wants to chime in to talk about what we need to explain, how we explain? Uh, anyone? The Layla person? Okay. Hi. Uh, first, let me apologize for being so late. I had a completely different time in my calendar. Um, so in terms of explainability um, and working with machine learning systems, um, there are several things to take into account. The first one is um, what do we need to communicate? If it's not necessarily explaining exactly what the machine is doing, what do we need to communicate? The basic necessity that we need to communicate is uncertainty. So if you work with a machine learning algorithm, 
you know when it's confident about uh, its prediction and you know when it's not. So you can make an educated decision based on this knowledge. Um, so that's the first thing. And then when it comes to explainability, interpretability, it's very difficult because now the machine learning models that are working the best are neural networks. And neural networks are kind of uh, inspired from by the brain and it's basically neurons that are linked together through mathematical operations and then these mathematical operations get re-adjusted based on the data that they see and the predictions that they make. So. Uh, if you just want to look at the structure, I, I could show you these neurons fired together when you showed this input. That wouldn't really tell you much about what the algorithm is really doing, is really thinking. So there's one approach um, that I think is really promising, which is building a relationship through time with the model. So that's what we do with human beings. When you get to know somebody, you actually build a model of this person. You constantly try to predict what they're going to do, what they're going to say, and that's how you kind of build a relationship with somebody. So that's an approach that we're taking right now as well with machine learning models. If you can look at, it's at the inputs that you give it, and you can probe it, give it certain inputs just to see what it's going to predict. And if after some time you can start to understand or start to build a model of what it's going to do, then you will have a better sense of what your model does and where it, where it fails, uh, where it's successful. So that's an approach that's kind of uh, based on the relationship, relationship building between humans. Uh, and that's an approach that we're taking for interpretability because there, there have been studies where we show that people feel like they can trust the model more if they can, try if it, if they can predict to some extent what it's going to do for certain inputs. Um, and I think that's the most promising approach because there are other approaches where you try to build another model that's going to explain in words what the model of interest is doing. But when you're doing this, you're building another model that's going to add some noise to your prediction. So it's just adding noise on top of noise. It's not very, um, very tangible as an approach. So the approach that I think is the most promising is the, the one of building a relationship through time uh, with the model, be between the model and the decision maker. Uh, and so that requires being able to probe the model, give it certain inputs, look at what it's going to predict, and over time trying to predict yourself what the model is going to do. And also trusting the model because the model is going to tell you, I am not really confident about this input, so you should make the decision. You, should re you shouldn't really trust me on that on that one. That's how we're going to build, build a trust relationship. If models are capable of communicating in certain ways, their uncertainty uh, given certain inputs. Um, that's kind of the two aspects that are being explored right now in terms of interpretability of machine learning models and how we can make them collaborate efficiently with humans. Thanks, Leila. If I may, uh, a couple of follow-up follow questions. Uh, one is you mentioned uncertainty. And, and this all, my questions apply to the average user that's going to use this technology because a lot of what you explained it sounds like it's still data scientists highly technical people trying to advance the science and the art of it but once something is ready and you put it in the hands of actual user to use it let's say it's a, a bank who has to make decisions to make loans or not to people who apply for a loan and let's say the model when a candidate comes in they fill out all their forms and the model comes up with a prediction that says there's a 30% chance this person will default and not pay, meaning 70% chance that they will. It, let's say I'm a loan officer, I don't really understand any of the science. How do I use that information uh, to make my decision whether to approve or not? And is there any effort currently in, in the data science to look at how do we help the user of these models to uh, thoughtfully use the prediction so that it's appropriate use of the, the recommendation uh, as opposed to kind of blind faith following whatever the machine says. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is, I guess the approach that comes to mind uh, immediately is multitask learning. So you can train your model to predict if you should give a loan to somebody or not. And at the same time predict certain attributes for this person so that you can try to explain why you make that decision. One concrete example is recommender systems. When you look at Netflix, when you log into Netflix, it will tell you, I'm proposing these movies to you because recently you watched other 
superhero movies. It tries to provide some explanation of its prediction, and that's that's how we trust it, and that's how we understand why it's showing us those movies in particular. So that's done through um, learning characteristics about your data. So you can say you uh, should, there is a 30% probability that this person will not pay this loan uh, because this person has the following characteristics. So you can try to build some explanations uh, by basically saying what you're looking into when you're looking at this individual in particular. Uh, and that's done through, that's techn the technical term for this is multitask learning. You can train your model to make predictions and also um, extract some properties of the, the input data that you feed it uh, so that it can, it can tell you what it's focusing on to make this decision. And then you can, that gives you sort of a, a beginning of an explanation for you to understand why it, it gave you that number in particular and what you should do with it. Well, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think whereas uh, it's important to remember that these types of deterministic algorithms, they calibrate themselves. And so because they identify so many patterns, often they're usually too complex for humans to either understand or trace decisions or recommendations made by it. However, I think I want to go back to a point I made earlier about human keeping the human in the loop in terms of every decision that AI makes, especially contentious ones that somebody um, uh, appeals or, or uh, uh, thinks is discriminatory. Um, the growing use of AI in vulnerable decision categories, such as issues of criminal justice, really risks interfering with rights to be free from interference from, of personal liberty. And so, for example, when governments do use these tools, they're essentially handing over um, decision-making to private vendors. And the engineers at these private vendor companies um, are not elected officials. Um, they use data, data analytics and design choices to code policy um, that are often unseen by the people that it's impacting. And so again and again, I think it's really important to go back to not only um, keeping the human in the loop, but also human rights risk assessments. This is crucial. We need to see what possible uh, discriminatory outcomes come out of these algorithms, um, how they can be remedied, uh, what types of explainability. And again, I want to mention that often these machine learning systems are very complex. And so how do we translate, translate that in a way that makes it, as you mentioned, Bernard, um, intelligible and, 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 and understandable by the people who are um, being impacted by it. So just to kind of underscore that as we continue this conversation. Thanks, Wafa. Uh, David or Scott, you, you, uh, whichever order. Um, thanks. Yes, I would like to make two points. Um, and I agree very much to what was said before. I mean, one thing is uh, there are a lot of initiatives going on at the moment that works always towards, or towards building trust and, and, and also how to go about these developments. I mean, just to, to name at the European level, we have uh, the Europe, uh, European uh, Commission has this high-level group, uh, high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, which works towards sort of an ethics code, uh, how to deal with these topics. Um, there are a lot of national initiatives uh, and regulations going on, and we also need to see what comes out of these regulations. Uh, the Council of Europe is very active in the area, has several expert committees uh, working towards uh, standard setting and, and recommendations and soft law. And I think all uh, the outcomes of these initiatives will also help to build trust and see how to go about it. Um, what we said in our first output on, 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 on on the topic is uh, we also have the data protection uh, legislation and the uh, data protection framework, uh, at least in, in the EU, it's quite strong. Um, and this is also a good starting point, as was mentioned before, how to go about these uh, challenges. And it was um, mentioned that human rights impact assessment is really the way to go. I mean, if you plan to deploy something, just look in advance and also throughout um, what impact it could happen. But this, as was said, is quite challenging because, I mean, first of all, there is also a, a lot of balancing of rights involved, and it was said transparency and accountability. So um, there's the question with intellectual property rights uh, versus um, um, 
uh, discrimination opening up uh, what you have. Uh, transparency just doesn't mean you, uh, you, you cannot share all the data simply because of data protection issues. Um, then there's also the question of data protection versus detecting discrimination because if you want to detect discrimination, you need information on protected attributes. But this is information you actually should not uh, collect if possible. So, so th this is also a, a, a sensitive area where a discussion needs to be uh, done for each case separately because it's always important in the different context. And in the GDPR, for example, we also have this uh, uh, sort of a right to explanation and there's a lot of discussion going on of what this actually means, right to explanation. And uh, I just want to uh, underline as a uh, last point that probably uh, we need to reduce also our expectations of what it means to, to understand something. Um, when I just think back of, of what has happened in statistics a long time ago, and I mean, even in, if you look into uh, academic journals, people usually misinterpret statistical models. So it's, it's not so straightforward to interpret statistical models, and this is why I very much agree that it needs some time also to, to learn how um, uh, complex algorithms work. At the same time, the algorithm and the complexity of it, I mean, there are several ways to show what has an impact on the predictions for all the different algorithms that are used, be it neural networks or uh, others which are easier to interpret, but still difficult to interpret. Um, but then, in addition to understanding the algorithms, which is an important point, there's also the input data. So, of course, looking into what data are being used to train certain algorithms is a very important point. And then just also looking into the output, that's the, the, the the last stage, so looking into predictions. And I think here also literacy should increase, like what does it mean to have a false positive rate, a false negative rate? What does it mean in specific contexts and how to understand this? So I think uh, a lot of work is being done and we will learn much more in the future how to go about these issues. Thanks, so I'll, um, I'll give an example of, I think, how um, companies have tried to, to grapple with this, uh, the dilemma of accountability and transparency and what it means at least uh, from the example from one country, uh, one, one company, um, and it also, the, the outcome also circles us back to the initial discussion on how artificial in intelligence can both be a tool uh, in addressing human rights violations, but also as a double-edged double -edged sword. And I'll, I'll use the example in part because Wafa um, took all of my talking points on, on the UN talking points, <laughs> the UN guiding <laughs> principles and how we view these, these things. And no, but and it's always annoying when a non-UN person does it in a more articulate fashion than people who actually work for you. <laughs> so hats off to you, um, Wafa, very well, well done. Um, my example is a recent um, case uh, that involves Facebook's role uh, in Myanmar uh, and their reaction to very strong criticism uh, from the United Nations and a, a host of other uh, non-governmental and governmental organizations. Um, our own UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, referred to the situation in Myanmar as textbook ethnic cleansing, and the UN fact-finding mission recently published a report on the situation in, in Myanmar um, that referred to Facebook 179 times in the main, the main body, not, not counting the footnotes. In terms of holding Facebook to account, um, the company had an interesting uh, and tran somewhat transparent uh, response, which was to do a human rights impact assessment. Uh, and they went to uh, an independent body um, to carry out a human rights impact assessment uh, and to make recommendations, which I thought was an interesting way. They, they did this in part under their, in, in, uh, in, um, under their obligations as a member of the Global Network Initiative, uh, the GNI. Um, they were transparent and they recently published um, both the report, the human rights uh, impact assessment, uh, which was um, done just over the last, last couple of months. Um, and they also um, sort of published their own reaction to the report and put it in uh, a, very, a very positive frame. And I'll, I'll leave this, the process um, for you all to comment. What strikes me as interesting is in their reaction to a very serious human rights problem of ethnic cleansing, mass displacement, mass killing, mass rape, uh, and much of that linked with uh, the role of Facebook as a social media platform, Facebook has uh, employed um, both human, but in particular more artificial intelligence in trying to detect graphic images of violence or speech that might incite to hatred, discrimination, uh, or violence. But they've upped their use of artificial intelligence in trying to detect uh, and either uh, reduce circulation um, 
of types uh, of images or speech um, or eliminate it altogether, which leads us back to the initial um, dilemma, of course, or risk um, to freedom of expression and whether the, the algorithms that are being used in that intelligence to pull down speech, to pull down images, are fine-tuned with enough human involvement so that they're not restricting free speech. Thank you, Scott. Uh, before wrapping up part one, uh, I want to ask one more question, Leila. I want to turn to you because you, you know, we worked together at Microsoft and you shared with me one time earlier, we talked about different existing human institution, human decision-making institution, whether it be jobs, you know, deciding what job, you know, whether somebody gets a job when they apply for it. There could be discrimination against women. There could be age discrimination, whether it be discriminating against young candidates or old candidates. So I recall in my, some of my conversations with you, you talk about a very standard, well, a, a very uh, useful AI technique to kind of test that. So when you have a bunch of data of existing human institution, human decision-making, how do you test and verify whether it's biased or unbiased? Uh, what, you know, if you can ex use an example, how you can do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, uh, one, thing, one good thing that has come out that the, from the fact that our machine learning algorithms are working so well now is that they can learn um, to imitate human decision making. So what you can do is give a data set of uh, human decisions to a model and train it to reproduce those decisions. And then the nice thing about this is then afterward you can probe this model and look at its errors and look at uh, its predictions and you can see if it's biased against certain groups. So you can see my model makes more errors for women, for instance, or for people of a certain age so that means there is bias in the initial data that I gave to my model. So that means there was bias in the human decisions upstream. Um, so that's one way of doing this. You can, you can test the model on human data and see, and, and what you, can, you can test this model on any data. So you can give it data for different groups and then check that this model is making fair predictions for those different groups. And that tells you about the data that you gave it uh, in the first place. And uh, so one way to, to measure fairness is to, wh what I was saying earlier, is to look at the errors that the model make and say, my model is going to be fair if it makes the same amount of errors for all the different groups that I'm looking at. If it makes the same amount of errors for women, for men, uh, for different ages, for different races, then I know that my model is fair because it is not treating one group better than another. It's making equal amount of errors across all the, all the groups that I'm looking into. Um, so that's one way of looking in, in for bias in human-generated data. And it's not only human decisions, uh, data sets of human decisions. It, bias is everywhere. There, there's this, um, there was this study on word representation. So when we, when we want to train a neural network to deal with language, we give it a vector that represents a word. And those, those, this vector is a representation of the word and, and something that the network can understand. And those representations, we learn from massive amounts of data from the internet, for instance. And there was this study that showed that representations learned on news articles, professional news articles. So you would think this data is unbiased. It's, it's written by professional journalists. Wha the representations that we learned was biased and the, the interesting thing with this representation is you can do some um, operations on the vectors. You can do those little riddles. Um, men is to king as woman is to queen. And what we saw, and the way we saw that this data was biased against women um, was we tried other riddles. So we tried uh, men is to computer scientists as woman is to, and the response we got was homemaker. And the bias came from professional news articles. It's because society is biased. So the data that we produce is biased and then the model itself is biased. But the nice thing is we can test the models and we can see if they're biased and then we, co we can correct for this. Thanks, Leila. Um, I want to turn, uh, stop for a moment to see if there's any uh, p audience participation, whether in the room or online. I see the online speaking queue is empty, but uh, anyone? No questions. Is there anyone in the room that wants to comment on or ask a question 
about part one. And in the interest of time, if you could keep your comment or question to one minute or more. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear what you were saying. Um, my name is Nicholas. I'm a researcher at the University of Duisburg Essen. I do AI uh, applications on privacy. Um, you talked about different stages on the development of an AI product, namely data collection, data conditioning, training, testing, and validation. Have you came up with a standard for each of these particular um, activities? And, uh, and what is the role of risk management in that? Thank you. Um, I can talk for the, from the research uh, community perspective. There are, um, so as you said, problems can occur anywhere in the pipeline from data collection to model formulation to metrics to model release. Uh, so how do we standardize this whole pipeline so that we make sure that what we release is safe and unbiased? From the research community perspective, there's a lot of work on that. And there's some recent work from uh, some of my colleagues at Microsoft, which is called data sheets for data sets. So whenever you want to, the idea with this is whenever you want to release a data set publicly so that other researchers can, can train their models on, you need to document this data set very thoroughly so that they can understand what this, how this data was collected, if it was collected in an ethical manner, um, what groups are represented in your data so that you know what, sometimes you see a data set and you think I'm gonna train my model, it's gonna work for everybody. That's not, that's not clear, right? So you need to say in your data which groups are represented so that you, you know and other people who, wants, who wanna use this data know that uh, it can't be used for everybody. It can be used for just those groups in particular. Um, so that's one way of standardizing things and uh, the research community is more and more buying into, into those standards. And then there's a more work to be done on um, the models and reporting those models out as well because we also put a lot of models out there in an open source manner. So we need to say exactly what they can do, what they should be used for, what was our intention when we built them. Um, so there's, it's not uh, completely formulated yet, I would say, those standards, but there's a lot of work going on uh, towards that and uh, more and more researchers and more and more companies are starting to adopt those st emerging standards. Uh, gentleman in the first row in the corner, this next, I think. And next would be that. You know, let's, let's hope this question makes sense. It's only sort of making sense in my head, but uh, this goes uh, mainly to Waf and Scott maybe, uh, who mentioned your guiding principles and <laughs> human rights impact assessments. Um, I work at the Danish Institute for Human Rights uh, in our human rights and business department, and we do a lot of human rights impact assessments. But what we're seeing, I think, when we're engaging with companies that are already, as their kind of core business, they're doing good, they seem to often kind of forget some of the human rights implications of the work that they do. Um, so I'm wondering, do you see these hurdles as well uh, in your work? And how do you think we can um, help these companies actually interact with human rights and not necessarily just ethics as a topic which often is much more abstract uh, than human rights which actually has uh, processes and interpretations? Sure, no, and thanks for the question. And also thanks for making the point on the, the value added using a human rights framework, um, I would say in addition to an ethical or a value-based framework, not, not replacing it, but we, we fully agree and it's one of the points that we've been, we as UN have been making with private sector that the human rights law, the international human rights framework gives you a good tool. It actually helps you do quite a bit of work uh, in terms of uh, managing your, your risk and your exposure as a, as a business. Um, I think there are a number of companies, perhaps most companies, would argue that they are generally doing good, either for their, um, their shareholders or, or for the, the, world, the world at large. So I think your, your point is, or your question is very well, very well taken. Um, one of the, the methodologies we've found that's, that's useful in addressing it with companies is peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and in fact, it's something I wasn't planning on giving you a plug, Bernard. But um, in fact, it's something we've been doing with Microsoft over the last couple of years with some success, but creating an environment uh, in which the UN um, uh, guiding principles on business and human rights can be discussed in a very frank, very practical peer environment amongst businesses, but with a, a strong uh, injection from, uh, from the UN and the human rights.
those principles. So that's I think just one very concrete way that that's, that's being done, and certainly, certainly many others. But Waka, do you want to jump in? I, I think that's great. I, I didn't hear about the peer-to-peer -peer program before. I think it's a really nice collegial way to, to, to share knowledge and, and, and ways to be more hum compliant with human rights. Uh, I also think that states uh, have an obligation to put in place regulation that, uh, that I don't want to say forces, but helps make the process easier for uh, treating that data in a way that respects human rights. Um, also, I, I did want to mention that sometimes technical standards, actually most of the time, technical standards uh, are important um, to be complementary to uh, uh, human rights uh, regulation. And when I say human rights regulation, I mean uh, regulation that deals with non-discrimination, privacy, uh, data protection, and other types of uh, law at the national level uh, that, that expand upon and reinforce human rights. So uh, I don't know if uh, anybody else wants to say, add anything else. No. If the, so we'll, if, if not, we'll go to the last question, the lady on the fourth row in the middle. Please go ahead. That would be our last question before we go to the last part. I have a question for Lila and Wafa concerning when the data input model is already biased. Um, the example of Wafa about using IA in the criminal justice system, such as a COMPASS program, taking into consideration when the criminal justice system is already racist, for instance, in Brazil, my country, 64% of imprisoned people are black. AI will just reproduce this racism in the model. So how can we mi mitigate bias when reality and data is already biased, is already discriminatory? Thanks for the question. Um, I would say that's an unsolved problem <laughs> right now. Uh, there has been work on, there's one thing we, we, we must be aware of is that when there is bias in the data, a machine learning model can not only reproduce that bias, but also amplify it. And there has been work on making sure that at least we don't amplify the, the bias in the data. So if the number is 60%, our model should also reproduce that number of 60%. Then in terms of um, training models on biased data, I think that's kind of what I w my point earlier was, when you train a model, you can at least make sure you can at least test it and you can see that it's biased. You can see that it will give you a higher number for uh, people of a certain race. So you can decide then not to use it and you can say there is a problem at the beginning in this data, in the decision making. And there is actually, um, I attended a tutorial by a group at, at Carnegie Mellon University and uh, they're doing ethical natural language processing and they worked with the police because um, I, I don't remember in which state it was exactly, but the police um, gave them some data recordings of when they were uh, stopping cars. And what they found by training models was that um, the policemen were taking more time in average to tell, the, to tell the, the, the driver the reason why they stopped them when this driver was African American. So they identified the bias in this decision making thanks to a model. And then they, the only thing they could do was work with the police to tell them, this is what is happening. So you, you need to be aware of this and then you need to, correct, to rectify your own behavior. Uh, so that's one way of, of using machine learning to correct bias in the data itself so that then the data hopefully will become unbiased with time and then we can use it for training models. But uh, yes, as long as you identify bias in the data that is very, uh, that is significant at that and that is, uh, that can potentially be, potentially be harmful for certain groups, you should not use that data. You should, you should rectify it. So closing comment that also touches upon the question that was just asked. The difference between uh, regular decision making by humans and decision making that's made by machines is that um, let's say even if a machine is 99.9% .9 accurate all of the time, that 0.01% can impact thousands of lives. So for example, in the criminal justice system, as you mentioned in Brazil or even the United States, um, 
that means people would be falsely identified, incarcerated, uh, detained, their lives would be severely affected. And so we go back to the question of effective remedy and effective appeal mechanisms for the individuals who have been, uh, who have had their rights violated and their personal freedoms infringed upon. And so this is crucial and uh, uh, it's, it's a component of the whole framework that we cannot forget or, or uh, put aside. So in the remaining five minutes or so, um, thank you for, for the questions, by the way. In the remaining five minutes or so, I want to ask uh, each of the panelists one question. Uh, as the session organizer, the IGF has impressed upon us that it, they really want the IGF to be impactful even beyond uh, the conference itself. What is the next step? How can we continue to work together to make progress? So my question to each of the panelists is, if you were to name in your mind the top idea of continuing collaboration across different stakeholders uh, to work on any particular issue, uh, what is your suggestion of the next step, follow up, and, and what kind of collaboration, who needs to work with whom, and what should they work on um, so that we can hopefully, even after we leave this room, continue to maintain those or establish those connections and try to make progress together? Um, anyone want to jump in first? Um, yes, um, as I, I mentioned, and so before, I mean, standard setting and policy initiatives are underway. So there are many initiatives ongoing, and in, in follow up, I think it's important to continue working together on these topics. And that uh, I see there are so many people working on the topic and, and sit together and um, use the existing fora uh, to contribute, um, which I mentioned before, which happened uh, at the uh, at the level of the European Commission, but also at the Council of Europe to try to contribute to this with your level of expertise. Because what is challenging in this area is that there, there are so, so many different, it's so broad that we need uh, interdisciplinarity to, uh, to really get a better understanding on how to move forward. Um, I, I like to always give the example, I mean, I have a statistics background, and, and when I then learn, learned about the computer scientists, um, it took me a while to realize that we are speaking about the same, same things, but just using different terms. Mm -hmm. um, so, so even at this level, it's important to work together and get a better understanding, but then also not to forget um, also to involve uh, uh, lawyers and, 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 and the judiciary. Um, because it's also at the level of the law that, and, and the courts will also need to make important decisions in this respect. And this way it's really important for both sides, so from the technical side and uh, also the legal side, to have a good understanding and uh, what's going on. And, of course, not to forget uh, subject level expertise. So I, I, th I think there's no, no one like rule that or what percentage can work or cannot work in one way or the other. So it needs to be decided on each of the uh, context separately again and discussed anew. So interdisciplinarity and contribution to the ongoing initiatives I think is an important way forward. Um, so totally agree. I, I would add uh, in the UK we have um, created what we call the AI Council, which is uh, an independent executive membership of um, people that represent uh, experts in the community that come from government, from uh, the private sector, and from academia, and um, and help advise government on our priorities and, and how to how to take things forward and what we should look at and horizons and etc. Um, as part of this, we have expert advisory groups that sit around the council and they look at a, a number of different things. So they look at ethics, they look at uh, international, they look at um, human rights, they look at data sharing um, models and, and, and skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, as, a, as a concrete point, um, it would be great to have involvement in that um, from civil society, from, from the UN, from others, to make sure that we continue these conversations forward, to make sure that they are prevalent and at, at the front and center of kind of state actors' minds um, in the decisions that we make and take, um, but also um, we can also influence back in the other direction um, to other countries as well. Yeah, just as a segue to that, um, on the, the, the question of collaboration and going forward on the, on the what in terms of mechanisms, um, 
I'll, I'll just make a suggestion, actually, that um, the, the UN has, this UN Secretary General has launched a high-level panel on digital cooperation. And I think they're looking at exactly this, this question in a broader way, not just looking at collaboration or cooperation on AI, but cooperation uh, around, around the planet on, on new technologies. Um, so I think, and the, the high-level panel have people that are here at the, the IGF. They had a session yesterday. They're encouraging input from all stakeholders. They've promised written feedback on all input uh, in a transparent way, I think, on their, their website. And they're also, they will eventually look for feedback on their recommendations. So I think there's, there's a process there that may be um, of interest to contribute to uh, in terms of defining a way forward. Um, and on the how, I think David's points on um, having an inclusive, uh, a, a multi-sectorial approach, again, I won't, won't repeat, I'll just fully endorse. Um, but also on inclusivity, I think crucial going forward to bring in parts of the world, um, sectors of society that are at the greatest, rich, uh, greatest risk of becoming further marginalized um, from the potential gains, social and economic gains, due to um, artificial intelligence. Um, and that, of course, reflects also a general lack to technology and, and internet. But I think it'll be um, crucial to bring in those sectors, uh, the, most, the most marginalized and including um, those that don't have access to the internet, which is a, a major challenge to try to engage those stakeholders uh, in the conversations going forward. I um, I am going to agree with everything that, that was said on this. I think it is very important to have more um, gatherings where you have both the technical community and the research community and policymakers, uh, lawmakers, etc. Because I go to I have had the opportunity to go to both events events that are fully technical events that are uh, mostly about policymaking and I'm always I'm always a bit sad that there is not more cross pollination between the two groups and I think there has been some work on this I know uh, that Canada has been doing this and government of France has been doing this uh, consulting with AI leaders uh, from uh, companies and research to build their AI strategy. Uh, for instance, in France, they had uh, Cédric Villani, who's a mathematician and um, me a fields medalist, uh, designed the, the, the AI strategy for France by working with others uh, from the sector. And I think we need more of this because there's a lot of work on the research side on fairness, ethical AI, uh, accountability, transparency, there's lots of technical solutions that are being proposed for the, these issues and there needs to be more uh, cross-pollination between this and policymakers. Uh, they need to be aware of those solutions and, and take them into account as much as possible or guide our technical design of those solutions based on what is a necessity for their, their nations. So that, that's what I would call for mostly, more um, cross-domains events where uh, people of different backgrounds can meet different countries um, with different interests so that we can come together and maybe build some of those standards that we need for uh, building unbiased and fair AI. Uh, echoing and fully endorsing what Scott just said earlier. Um, also, I did want to mention that it seems that uh, there is a role to be played by trade unions or industry unions as well, or chambers of commerce, um, that can work with businesses that employ AI or develop or research AI to look into what these questions uh, of bias and algorithms or discrimination and algorithms really mean by involving multiple stakeholders um, and not just engineers in the tech sector, but also um, lawyers, associations, uh, civil society organizations that advocate for uh, detainees or prisoners, uh, especially when it comes to more sensitive topics such as criminal justice. Um, and there's also a role for professional organizations like uh, uh, bars, like uh, for lawyers as well, to do different CLEs, educating lawyers what the legal, what it means to, to have AI be discriminatory legally and what kind of regulation um, can be or should be or um, is well suited and adapted to address these kinds of uh, biases as well. So I think it's, I mean, a lot is already taking place with the IGF and various stakeholders coming to the table, but I also think that it's on, it's upon industry to also um, look into these questions as well.
Thank you, Watha. That, those comments remind, the comments by all the panelists remind me of one other organization. It's a Partnership for AI, uh, PAI. Uh, it, it was started primarily by data scientists, but it's turning into a, essentially a multi-stakeholder effort with lots of different organizations participating uh, to look at how uh, good practices on responsible use of AI. So there's, there's no lack of uh, opportunities and organizations that one can get involved in to help lend your voice and contribute to making good progress uh, uh, to uh, achieve the benefit, to realize the benefit of AI and yet mitigate the risk. I thank you all for p coming to uh, first mo session in the morning and I also want uh, us to take, this mo take a moment to uh, thank all our panelists for their contributions and comments. Thank you very much.